Thank you, Martin. Uh, I see this is on. Um, did he say seminar or sleep after? Yeah. <laughs> um, this is going to be tough because uh, after following probably the greatest jokester in the philosophy circle, uh, Henrik Suess, and Martin is known for his, uh, um, uh, for his witticisms, though two of them are, are keeping us often in stitches. So I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to go right to what I would like to do with you this afternoon, which is the Q&A, essentially, and to get you involved in helping me think about um, certain kinds of cyber conflict and what we are to make of them. And the reason I thought would defer to you is because generally it's the case that while I'm very interested in this stuff, I suspect many, if not all of you, know way more about it than I do. And so you'll have some intuitions that would help guide us. In fact, I was mentioning to Henrik this, these cases that are, um, are up here now that I'd like to, uh, to talk to you about uh, come out of the Journal of Military Ethics. Um, in a debate we're having trying to understand how cyber war and cyber conflict ought to be understood by looking for appropriate analogies in the real world and figure out what we'll do then and then figure how, whether or if this translates over into the cyber realm. So let me start with that. And um, the, the, the first case there asks you if you would, uh, how, how you would react uh, to a scenario in which real human beings wearing real black ninja suits uh, as nation state agents from a foreign power were observed attaching real, you know, bombs and mines and grenades and explosive devices to bridges, power stations, uh, dams, uh, air traffic control centers in Aurora, uh, Illinois, and so forth. Uh, to set them on fire or to disrupt them. If that happened and we observed them, how would we as a nation, how would our government, how would you in the military think about, respond to, what would you propose to do uh, about these incidents? Over to you. Grab a microphone. <laughs> First wake up and then <laughs> grab your mic and let's hear, you know, what, what you think of an activity like this, clearly clandestine sabotage of some kind. Uh, Ma'am, right here, what, what's your reaction to this? Well, I think um, obviously living in the U.S. that would be a huge difference compared to what normally uh, we're exposed to. So, I mean, I think first you go through all the phases of fear and then you question it, um, anger, and uh, uh, anger. Just doubt. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, depending on how long it's going on and what the, the motive is and the motivation, then obviously response. There you go. Follow. It's a, yeah, the fear and anger, um, outrage, terror. Uh, this, this would not sit well with us, I assume. We would assume if we captured some of these people and discovered that they were state agents, that they were from a foreign government, as I mentioned, the first would be, oh, they're terrorists. Maybe they're domestic terrorists, maybe they're foreign terrorists. Oh, no, they're coming from the People's Republic of China, or they're coming from North Korea. Let's try North Korea, just for the sake of argument. Uh, we discover that these folks are from North Korea. What are you going to do with them when you've arrested them and, and discovered this? Anybody? What would you want to do with them? What would you want to do about North Korea? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the things we struggle with now, sir. I mean, we, right. we invaded Afghanistan after 9-11 because they were harboring terrorists, and then we capture the mastermind and we try him as a criminal, not as a agent of a non-state actor, not as a warrior, but as a criminal. So. I think the issue would be up to the politicians. Would we treat these non-state agents as agents of the state and thereby hold them under war powers, or would we treat them as criminals and just put it under the umbrella of terrorism? There you go. That's an interesting point. Is what we have here a criminal act, or is it a state-to-state, -state, uh, interstate conflict? 
Um, how do we treat the individuals if we apprehend them? Do we treat them as criminals and put them in jail and put them on trial for domestic terrorism, for acts against the safety of the public? Or when we discover that there's a conspiracy and a nation involved behind them, do we do something different? Suppose just for example that this didn't happen once, it happened several times. First time, maybe we found the devices and said, who the hell put these there? And we took them down and there was a hubbub over, you know, do we have terrorists in our midst and are our surveillance devices sufficiently robust to catch them and so forth. And then they come again. This time we see them. People say, hey, there are people in black ninja suits up there on the bridge and they're putting explosives up there. And the police come and they arrest them. And they find that it's not just one city, but many cities where these folks have been. And they're doing just that. They're putting up uh, explosive devices on vital infrastructure. It's quite clear that the infrastructure itself will be damaged. And in the course of that damage, if those things should go off, um, people will lose lives. There'll be a lot of a loss of life. So we arrest them, we put them in jail. Now what? We found out they're from North Korea. And this is the second time they've done it. How about you? Ryu. <laughs> Shall I come down and grab everybody? I don't know, make sure. Help me out here. I don't know what, the, what to do about this. What would you recommend? Well, at this case, it's not going to, I don't think we consider it as the criminal case anymore. It's, um, we, well, we have to de well, we have to determine whether it's a terrorist uh, act or not. It depends on their, their purpose, so it depends on the agency you can find out more information of, behind the purpose. Who backing them up? Are they, yes, they're from North Korea, but okay. are they backing up by the governments or are they just rogue agents? So, so we don't really know the intention behind the group, so we can't really go full military to military action against that nation, whoever it is. So we have to find out more until before we make a... Um, okay, uh, so we're going to need some more information. We're going to have to interrogate these folks. <laughs> and uh, that yields all kinds of interesting and difficult prospects in itself. But suppose they're truthful. Yes, we are agents of the government, they say. The government of North Korea, the government of the People's Republic of China or something. They identify their nationality and they, they say their work. Well, of course, are they telling the truth? <laughs> We need to know that. So presumably we get on the horn or we send somebody to, if it's the People's, uh, uh, People's Republic of China, we go to the embassy, we complain, we, we just caught your guys. Um, and the embassies, well, we, we don't know who they are. You know, they don't work for us. And we don't have diplomatic relations with North Korea, so we don't have anybody we can obviously ask. But the agents who are doing this stuff tell us they're working for a government we need to know if they are, and then if they are, and we know who the government is, all these questions about accountability and so forth, um, we need to tell them to cease and desist, or what? We've caught your agents now doing this two times. They say they work for you, you deny it, but then they keep coming back, they say the same thing. Oh no, they say something else interesting. Oh, we're not gonna set these off. We don't intend to blow up anything. We just want these in place in case you should get involved in our internal affairs over on the other side of the Pacific or something. And then if you get into an altercation over there that's none of your beeswax, we'll set off a couple of these things. But that'll be after you've done something wrong. We don't want to do anything. We have no quarrel with you. But we know you people in the US particularly the Navy people, projecting power all over the place. And we have no way of countering that. So we're sending our guys in here. At least that's what the, what the individual, you know, ninja-dressed guys, that's what we're doing. It's harmless. We don't mean any harm. We're not going to set them off. And they won't go off accidentally unless you get involved in our internal affairs, like arguing over who owns the Shinkaku Daiyu Islands or something. That's none of your business. That's our business. We have a treaty that we signed back in Cairo in 1940 that says the islands are ours. And then when everybody got together after World War II in Potsdam, the Americans and the British and the French and the Russians all said the islands are ours. And so we have it right here in writing. Oh, but the government changed. <laughs> oh, well, that doesn't matter. We're still China, Chinese. Those islands are ours. Now, if we try to take them and you try to interfere, we'll set these things off. But if you stay out of that, 
you've got nothing to worry about. Now, that's the story the ninjas are telling you, where the Chinese embassy is, we don't know who these people are. They don't work for us. This is a fantastic scenario. So now we're into international relations. Help me out here. How do we handle this? What's the next step? It's like a war game here. Except, well, that's the question. Is it, in fact, a war game? Yes. Well, sir, uh, Lieutenant Commander Alan Hester, I would say in this specific case of them installing these devices, albeit not planning to set them off unless this, then, and that occur, they still impinge upon our sovereignty, and that by itself is problematic. Right. It sounds like even just that not single but constant infringement of sovereignty, violation of uh, our rights of sovereignty, and appearing to put our citizens in jeopardy, uh, would invoke what in the discussion in our, uh, by Dr. Seuss in the preceding um, our lunch, would that this is a just cause for war, isn't it? Or is it? Do we threaten to go to war over this? Do we threaten to do something to the Chinese or to the North Koreans or to some of their hardware or what exactly would we do if this just kept happening, especially if we arrested them, we yelled at the embassy uh, folks, we yelled at the ambassador, we, we denounced the actions in our press and then we sent the people home and said, no, go home and don't do this again. And they kept coming back. <laughs> they kept, oh yes, here we are, you know, fixing more bombs on your bridges and so forth. How long does this go on before we do something, and what do we do? We've tried negotiations, we've tried arguing, we've tried denouncing people. Uh, we treated these folks as prisoners of war and repatriated them on the grounds, or at least on the promise, despite the denials that this wouldn't happen anymore, and it keeps happening. Anyone? This is your field, not mine. I mean, I'm, I'm one of those people Dr. Seuss was making fun of, you know, philosophy professor. You know, I talk about abstractions and weird stuff and trolleys and, you know, right, and pushing people in front of them, preferably my colleague Martin when he makes bad jokes and so forth. Um, so what, what, but this is your field. What would you do? What would you recommend being done? What would be being discussed in the ward room at this point? Yes. Okay, send special forces, and we'll do the same thing, exactly reciprocal to them. You know, but this is dangerous work. They're lucky they didn't get themselves blown up or killed. And we have no guarantees that if we sent our guys, they would be treated so well as we treated these agents of a far, alleged agents of a foreign government. But that would be a possibility, exactly a symmetrical, reciprocal response. Any other thoughts? How serious is this? especially since no harm has been done, and the agents involved in setting these trap door devices or whatever it is, these, 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 these bombs, uh, are saying, well, we're not gonna set them off. We're just using them as a deterrent. Now, obviously, you see where I'm going with this, but I'd like some clarity, because really, there are differences of opinion amongst those who argue about this in the pages of, of uh, Martin and Henrik's journal, I'm one of them. I mean, I think I know what I'd do, <laughs> but I'm not sure that we know collectively, and certainly we disagree on, on what we think we should do. Is this a serious enough cause for military action of some kind? Anybody? Yes. So I think in this case we can take a page from history, and this is a uh, smaller scale. It, you know, is this not like what happened in Cuba in '62? Not, they weren't threatening to launch missiles. It was really defensive. And, uh, but the stance, of course, rightly so, was this cannot stand. You know? mm -hmm. So this would be the same sort of thing. So eventually, I would think it would. Okay, so you all heard that, that essentially Cuba missile, missile crisis now taken into the 21st century, that this is something like that, planning nuclear weapons 
on soil 90 miles from the American coastline is seen as a hostile act, even if the argument is it's all defensive, we're not going to use them, we're only going to fire them if you in the U.S. try to invade Cuba again or do anything else that uh, really is, is, you know, unjustifiable from our standpoint. Only then would we ever use these. So they're a deterrent. They're not there. We're not, these are not offensive weapons. And some argument like that's being made here. We're putting these not just at, off your coast, but inside your country, on your infrastructure where people live and work and travel to work every day. Uh, and they're threatening the power and the water and the food supply and the transportation system. Um, but we're not planning to, to use them. We just want to deter you from military interference and adventurism abroad in our own affairs. So is this like the Cuban Missile Crisis? Does this call for something as dramatic? And you remember, historically at least, that was about as close as we've ever come to, to fighting an all-out nuclear war. It could easily have become one. And we were certainly prepared to do that if that's what it took. I mean, that's an interesting case. But the, the, it, OK, so is, is this like that? Yes? No? How many think yes? This is like the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is pretty serious. How many think, eh, I'm not so sure this is a big deal? People, what, who cares if they put bombs on our bridges? Okay. I'm not seeing a lot of hands. <laughs> uh, I see a, a few kind of wimpy, oh, this is not much, and then I see, oh, let's you know, nuke them into the Stone Age, and then everybody else kind of, oh, crap. When will he shut up? Uh, Soon, I promise. Soon, yes. Uh, sir, if you're if you're leading us down this uh, cyber threat, it's it is different. You know, and I, what and it is different. So, I look at history, and I think the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh -huh. So, if you're talking about cyber and you're talking about information, okay. I look at the same sovereignty issues mm -hmm. that happened uh, during the Protestant Reformation even Gutenberg with his printing press. And I look even just a little bit uh, further down history and I see you know, the, the communist threat and then the, hmm. the witch hunt that occurred in our own country because of ideas. Right. Okay. So what is a threat? We're making a lot yeah. of assumptions here. Okay, okay. So, that's, so that you would be nervous making this analogous to the cyber case, which is the next case up there. Is that right? you don't think it's a good analogy. Well, it might not surprise you then to think that some of the contributors and readers of the Journal of Military Ethics also don't think this is a, this isn't, these two aren't closely alike. They're different. So you think the first one though, the real physical one is serious. Okay, so the first one, if it occurred, would be serious. But if we turned it into a cyber case, then you would want to back off. No? I hear a no. Say some more. No, I think uh, a cyber attack, depending on how serious it is, which they're starting to occur in more frequency, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have to be a little bit more aggressive uh, of battling back in, the, in that regard. Uh, the first one uh, definitely gets me agitated. Uh, okay. And I think you do have to have uh, some type of uh, threat back to them of equal kind. Are you a Marine by any chance? Yes. Ah, thank you. Good. I was, I was, I was going to plead for some help and some <laughs> an expeditionary force to say, come on, guys. I mean, you know, the first one, that worries you. The second one, though, say that again. It's not, you're you're going to have to do something, but you're not sure what. You're going to have to uh, respond in kind with, with your own cyber yeah. attack back. Yeah, okay. So if we would send special forces in the first case to do to them what they had just done to us, we would send cyber weapons and trap doors and sabotage. And oh, by the way, we do. And we, you know full well more than I do that we already do this stuff. We're kind of at war now, if you want to call that a war. There's a constant state of low intensity cyber conflict. We all know this. And we're doing it to them and they're doing it to us and so forth. Uh, the question is what to make of it, see? And that's the thing that we were arguing about uh, in the, the Journal of Military. Is this serious and grave 
in the way in which the first case seems pretty serious and grave, a violation of sovereignty, a threat to the life and well-being and property of our, of our citizens, uh, a direct action against which you know, we would think we would be entitled to do something equivalent at least to the Cuban Missile Crisis and maybe something more, an embargo, um, special forces sent to do to them what they'd done to us and so forth. Uh, and then the, the second piece of this is, well, if we put it into the cyber realm, as I've done, and I tried to make these look identical, except, obviously, for the fact that in the second case, the trap doors are not actual dynamite and TNT and stuff. They are software programs that will end up doing exactly the same physical damage to those pieces of infrastructure as the dynamite and the grenades and the TNT or whatever the hell the ninjas were putting up there. So that when the smoke cleared in both cases, there would be rubble, if, if they went off, there would be rubble where there had been bridges and there would be people who were on them who were killed as they collapsed. There would be floods as the dams burst, but the dams wouldn't burst because dynamite blew a hole in the dam. They would burst because a software program caused an electro uh, turbine to you know, do like they did at Sandia and just, you know, operate faster and faster until the whole thing blew up and exploded. And that explosion, do I care whether it was an exploding hydroelectric power generator or a piece of dynamite that blew the hole in the dam that killed, I don't know, 100,000 people and flooded half of the Southwest? Does that matter? No? Okay. The effects are the same, so whether I use a cyber weapon or a physical weapon, whether I put the thing there by sending a ninja to tie up the bomb, as he would have to do, on the bridge or the dam, or whether I send it via my keyboard uh, and, and send a worm that uh, somehow infects my software that's running the power plant or, or whatever. If the physical effects are the same, it's the same. Yes? No? Sorry? I believe that the who did it matters. So is it North Korea or is it China? Is it another, is it another nation that we feel ah. we could take action against and win decisively? Or is it someone that we feel would drag us into a prolonged war? And I think that that in and of itself would dictate what our response was. Okay. So they're the same in terms of their effects, but in both cases, we would, as, just as we said, we have to verify the stories of the ninjas. Are they really from China, really from North Korea? Uh, they say you aren't. We would have to do the same thing in the cyber realm, the problem of attribution and accountability. We'd have to do our cyber forensics and figure out that the software that was planting the devices um, in the trap doors, uh, getting prepared to sabotage our, our infrastructure, did in fact come from Shanghai Unit 61384, whatever the hell it is. And if we d did know this, you, you all know we've indicted five members in U.S. criminal court, five members of the People's Liberation Army in that Shanghai unit by name. If they should ever travel to the United States, they would be under arrest. <laughs> now, of course, we don't expect them to, sh oh, yeah, it was me. I, I'm, I'm here to turn myself in. <laughs> we don't expect that to happen. We just wanted to address this question. We know you're doing it. That's how, you know, and you can deny it all you want, but we caught you red-handed. Your fingerprints, digital fingerprints, are all over this software. You, not just China, not just PLA Sh Shanghai Unit 61384, whatever the heck it is, not just that, you, Colonel Fang, have done this. And you wrote the software, we, we know you did it, and you're under arrest if you should ever come to the US, or if we can ever get a hold of you, we're going to put you in jail, put you on trial, yes. Sir, I think there are two big overlying issues here. First okay. of all, the effects are the same. Okay. Not every cyber issue is going to blow up dams and rain fury. So Thank there you. are actually lower level cyber effects that may not be the same as bombing bridges. Yeah. The other piece that you have that's very different is the uh, aspects of time and space. The fact that you may have these trap doors off US soil, or the fact that somebody can reach you from China almost instantaneously, and you don't actually have to move people across the world. I think these two issues are the bigger underlying pieces in the overall discussion. 
Okay. Thank you. Your uh, Cadillac Escalade is waiting outside, the prize you <laughs> for, for beautifully segueing into the problem that, yeah, if this was as simple as it was, maybe we would have learned something. The clear equivalent effects-based kinetic scenarios, at least and where attribution is not a question and we can figure it out, we know it's the Chinese, just like we knew it was the Russians putting the missiles and the... Um, uh, on Cuba, we know it's the Chinese putting these trap doors in our, in our software and they're going to do the same thing. We've indicted them by name, yada, yada, yada. Even so, things begin to erode. The analogy, like all analogies, isn't precise. And in a way, a lot of what we do in international relations, ethics, law, just war theory is look for analogies that work. Because we don't know how to think about this stuff. This is a brand new domain. You could compare it to how, I suppose, one of our uh, mutual friends, another, another brilliant philosopher by the name of Cook, but no relation to Martin, just a good buddy, James Cook, Colonel James Cook, out at the Air Force Academy, has likened this kind of situation we're in now to what it was like at the dawn of the age of aviation. You know, we didn't have any rules. Nobody had ever flown before. And pretty quickly, just as here, we get all kinds of stuff in the air, and some of it's government stuff, and some of it's private stuff. You got Wright brothers flying around, and then Wilbur opens a defense contracting industry in Dayton, Ohio, and we're off to the races, right? Uh, and we didn't have any rules governing this. So what did we do? Well, we said, well, this is not unlike navigating on the ocean. We have all you Navy guys. We have all these lights and patterns and um, you know, rules of the road and stuff. Couldn't we just take these and jimmy them a little bit and make them work in the air? which is what we did, right? And now we have government planes and private planes and commercial aviation and military aviation and all kinds of stuff going on without confusion, with no problems whatsoever. You know, everything is smooth, law and orderly and so forth. Well, <laughs> maybe not, but at least we know how to get around and deal with a lot of different kinds of phenomena and activities in the realm of aviation that we didn't know how to deal with in 1903. Um, and Jim predicts, Jim Cook predicts, we're going to do the same thing in the cyber realm. Okay, I'm here, you're here, let's do it. <laughs> See, there's the problem, the doing of it. What are the comparative, you know, how do we draw the analogies? So I started out with two, and I think we've beaten those two to death, and we're not finished yet. We're sort of, we saw some similarities, we saw some differences, and most of us sat on our hands. We weren't sure exactly what we should do in either case. But we were sort of clear, it sounds like, many of you seem to say, in the cyber case, whatever we would have done in the actual real world case, we would dial down a little bit, we would back off because things would be even more vague, attribution would be vague, damage would be difficult, harm to assess, and so forth. So we'd want to tread, and, and then we can act at the speed of light rather than having to transform, transport uh, our troops and project our power over 3,000 miles of sea space and in the air and so forth. Here, you know, since we could act quickly but we don't know what we're doing, maybe we better take a deep breath and keep our finger off the button and keep working on trying to understand this and keep yelling at the Chinese and <laughs> see if we can work something out. Let me just pause there. Questions, comments, so far so good? Yes. Uh, yes, sir, just one more comment. Uh, a lot of the effects we can get from cyber have been noted, and I agree that we can get kinetic effects, but cyber also adds one more option that we don't get with physical bridges, and uh, that's at least the theoretical possibility of making our cyber bridges impenetrable. Because these cyber hacks, these worms, these uh, viruses that infect our programs happen due to software flaws that allow right. data to make the program do something it was not designed to do. But the, the program, in any case, is doing exactly what it was programmed to do. It's, it's a, a flaw in the programming. Right. Yeah. So at least in theory, we can focus on making programs that can't be hacked, that ah, can be denied okay. their service you know, due to things that aren't up to the programmer's control, but they don't have to be wide open sieves like we buy today. That is an interesting observation and a really good one in that I have a colleague at postgraduate school who uh, I used to, remember, I retired. <laughs> um, but um, 
Uh, I had a colleague, I still have a colleague at postgraduate school, who's a computer scientist, and he says, you know, these cyber vulnerabilities, in a way, they're not like the bridge vulnerabilities. I'm not going to go get the engineer and say, why did you build a bridge that went over water, and now the Chinese can blow it up and drown people? I mean, you know, maybe there is a flaw in the bridge, and maybe they exploit the flaw, but, but presumably the flaw in the construction, if any, is not really what's at issue. It's the dynamite that the ninja is attaching to it. Flaw or no flaw, it's going to blow it to kingdom come. Whereas in the case of cyber, eh, you know, this was uh, Bill Gates' fault. He hired all these computer software engineers, paid them a month, had them all working and not really knowing what the hell they were doing, and every vulnerability, or at least most of the vulnerabilities, are Microsoft vulnerabilities are, or software vulnerabilities. And my computer science friend says, if you idiots who, like me, who do the computer programming, if you'd done your job right, there wouldn't be any cyber conflict because there'd be no vulnerabilities to exploit. Well, I don't know if that's fair. I don't write code. I don't think I could. I think it's very complicated. Maybe this is just a problem of dealing in a realm that is so complex that nobody could ever do it perfectly, and somebody else would sooner or later be smart enough to figure out where they'd screwed up, <laughs> and that that's the world we built for ourselves, a world of vulnerabilities, an internet of things. So uh, I've got an app on my phone that can, you know, turn my hot tub on at home. I've got another app on my phone, uh, the car I just bought yesterday that my wife is really pissed off at me for doing. Uh, I can turn that on from here. You know, I, can, I can't believe it. But of course, that means that those things and all the things that we have that are connected and networked that way, all through software, programs, and apps that somebody's writing like mad that are going to be full of flaws, we did this to ourselves. And that makes a big difference. We didn't do anything. We were innocent. We were the, the, the just warriors uh, in the first scenario who are being unjustly attacked by the ninja people strapping bombs to our, our uh, infrastructure. But we sort of set ourselves up for the cyber case, and so does everybody else. And the deeper we go into this, the more stuff we do, the more programs and apps we write, the more vulnerable we make ourselves to being attacked. So maybe that means when we are attacked, we can't be quite as indignant as I think my colleagues in the Marine Corps, at least, were ready to, to go to do something about this, right? In the, in the kinetic case, we, we know how to handle that. But maybe we can't be so indignant and so clear uh, in the cyber realm. Well, the segue for which you earned the um, Cadillac Escalade that's out in the parking lot was to talk about something else that's going on It's even more vague now that really is the subject of what I wanted to discuss with you. At least in that preceding case, there was a close analogy, wasn't there, between um, the sabotaging, physical sabotaging of our infrastructure and the cyber sabotaging of it if the cyber sabotaging was meant to destroy it physically. Now we've got a different kind of problem. We know these groups, you all no anonymous, I think. Some of the others you might not know so well. <coughs> and in any case, none of them are state agents. Uh, LULTSEC is a black hat organization of some kind that kind of takes great delight in exploiting the vulnerabilities you were just talking about. Uh, they just, they're, they're very smart folks, and they like to poke fun at banks. And uh, I think they went after Sony Pictures. and. I don't know who else have been their, their targets, but they, they kind of do stuff to them to show, I know how your stuff works and I can make it screw up anytime I want to. And to prove it, I'll deface something or make it not operate. Okay. Cyber Warriors for Freedom, that was a much more political group in Azerbaijan, I think. I mean, we're not sure where they are, where they, but, but the issues against which they were specifically protesting um, were, had to do with freedom of expression and some film festival that was being held in Azerbaijan, as far as I know. Anybody heard of these groups before? Anyone? Yeah? Okay. A couple, couple of you. Uh, well, everybody's heard of Anonymous, of course. They, they make themselves known. Kind of interesting. They're anonymous, but everybody knows who, not who they are, but that they exist. Okay. Um, well, yeah, what happens when the kind of things that that group does 
These are technically, on that first line, those are criminal actions, right? They deface public websites, they attack banks and shut them down. They might steal data or at least show you that they could if they wanted to, but they don't. Criminal acts. But they're not carried out like the 35 Russian kids who were stealing us all blind and stole $150 million before the FBI took the NSA software and caught them. Another story. Um, but um, uh, these guys are not enriching themselves, presumably at our expense. They're committing acts of political protest. And the term for this that we've developed is political activism. We take it to computer hackers and we come up with the acronym hacktivist. And that was the title of my talk, hacktivism. <coughs> Excuse me, but it wasn't just hacktivism, it was state-sponsored hacktivism which seems to me very different from what was on that first slide. Very different from the thing we're objecting and have indicted the five members of PLA, Shanghai unit, whatever it is, uh, 61398, there it is. Um, this seems to be demonstrations of disaffection and political protest carried out first, initially, by private groups like anonymous, individuals or uh, groups of citizens, we don't know who they are but they tell us what they're mad about, right? And they do things that would be considered criminal acts, like defacing public property and trespassing and possibly even theft of, of, of property, um, with a political purpose in mind, not for their own financial gain, or sometimes vid, uh, uh, vandals just do this kind of stuff because they're alienated computer geeks, right? And they don't like anybody, they don't have any friends, and so they sit there and mess everybody's Facebook page up or something. Uh, but this seems more serious than that. Okay, so far so good? Now we find that, hey, the Russian Federation did this. If we go back and think about what happened in Estonia in 2007, the famous much analyzed cyber attack, we could look at that and say, well, what that was, I mean, the Russian government denied any knowledge Right? And they so said, these were just patriots. Patriots upset with the behavior of Estonians who are moving Russian statue from center of town to uh, military cemetery. Uh, and they are expressing their outrage. How can we possibly control them? Well, I don't know. Uh, and that's a question. Did you put them up to it, Mr. Putin? Did you know about this? Do you approve of this? Did you encourage them? Did you give them money? Are they organized? You know, we don't know, right? We have no idea. Uh, so it looks like it's possible, at least, that the Russian Federation engaged. And actually, an article came out in the Wall Street Journal just a week ago. I was thinking about this and coming here, and what am I going to talk about? And here was the piece that said, hacking trail leads to Russia. And experts say malware found at US firm where military secrets were kept. The uh, FireEye folks, you know the security group, found this uh, and discovered that not only was it the Russians doing it, but he said, you know, they're much more dangerous than the Chinese. We got the five PLA guys because they're not as good. The, China, the Russians are really the super duper cyber experts. And this was a considerably more sophisticated set of attacks of this kind than we've ever seen before on American banks and financial institutions and you name it, okay? But they're not taking anything. They're not taking your money. They're just keeping you from getting at it for a few hours. They're shutting down trades and exchanges, which could cost you something if you're investing your retirement funds, as I did in the stock market, and that's why I'm here now, because I don't have any retirement funds, and so I have to do little gigs like this to keep afloat. Um, uh, <laughs> but um, they're, generally, they're not doing any harm, and the harm they do is reversible. We can put it all back. We can stop the DDoS attack, the distributed denial of service. We can restart the frozen accounts that we've locked. We can give you the password to the malware that we have you know, installed in your computer, and you can remove it after a time, just to let you know that we can do this to you or once our dispute with you is, is solved. Point is, states have been involved from fairly early on 
in doing a thing that otherwise we would think of as acts of political protest by individuals and groups of citizens or groups of vigilantes. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the right way to think about what these things are doing, what these people are and how we should think about them. This group here, the cyber fighters of Is al-Din al-Qassam, is an interesting example. How many of you have heard of the cyber fighters of Is al-Din al-Qassam? Yes? No? New to you. Well, the Is al-Din al-Qassam was a Muslim cleric who was an anti-colonial fighter in the Middle East of the 1920s, 1930s, about then. And these cyber fighters, this, they've taken their name from this exemplary Muslim patriot uh, who tried to fight against uh, colonial powers, largely Britain. Uh, who are they fighting against? Well, they took credit for an enormous attack on the 11th anniversary of 9-11 on US financial institutions. And this is one, if you watch the NSA revelations uh, taking place um, uh, after um, Snowden revealed his, uh, you know, that, that, that he had, had stolen all this information and blown the whistle, and then they let you in and so forth. They showed you a, a system known as Treasure Map, where you could see these attacks occurring all over the world. I mean, it was like something out of Batman. Uh, the Dark Knight Rises, you know, if you, if you remember the thing that, uh, that the police chief had in his, his office or something, you could see all this kind of communications and nodes and networks all over the place. Well, we actually have something like that. Treasure Map is the, the program that keeps track of these, keeps track of this. And this was an, a massive attack, one of the biggest ever suffered. And it was highly successful for a while, then it, it went away. And then this group tweeted that they had done this and they claimed what they were doing it was a political act. They were protesting the continued uh, availability of the film The Innocence of Muslims. How many of you uh, know of the film The Innocence of Muslims? Yes, a couple. Okay, this is the film that some American filmmaker made on his own, very critical of Islam, kind of portrays the prophet as a, uh, uh, well, in a very, very uh, uh, negative light. And so the claim was, we did this to you as an act of political protest against your, in the US, showing this film, we want the government to take it down. Stop. <laughs> For one thing, we can't do that, right? I mean, I think a lot of people would like to take the innocence of Muslims down, in, uh, in, innocence of, uh, uh, of Islam, the film, down, because it's offensive. And it causes us trouble. And it could get some of our guys killed in theater out of the reaction of angry people who think that we're all in this together defacing their religion and their, uh, their faith. So this seems like something we'd like to do, but guess what, this is a democracy, the government does not have that power, right? So we can't do that. Um, so why ask? I mean, you could protest, but why ask us to take it down? We can't do that. And then a, uh, uh, another funny thing was noticed that the tweet site, the anonymous site where the Twitter feed for the cyber warriors of uh, Is al-Din al-Qazam was announcing this, was the, turned out to be the same site when the FireEye guys looked at it and the Symantec security guys looked at it. That's the same thing that was used to announce the attacks on Aramco in Saudi Arabia a few weeks earlier. Huh, all starting to make sense. The banks that were attacked weren't just every financial institution in the U.S. They were banks that were complying with the U.S. economic embargo against Iran. So put this all into the hopper, what does it look like? Just detective work here. We've got attacks on banks that aren't, aren't releasing funds to Iran. We've got attacks on Aramco and the same tweet site used for this. What's going on? Looks like state-sponsored like state retaliation for Stuxnet and, and uh, um, Operation Olympic Games and so forth. Yeah, it looks like this is state-sponsored. It's Iranian. We don't know this, but it sure looks like it, just like it looked like it in these other cases. 
okay, if we look at it this way, I mean, this is not anything we haven't seen before, but now notice what we're doing. We're beginning to look at a kind of activity, hacktivism, normally carried out by private citizens for political purposes. We're discovering states are doing the same thing, and they seem to be doing it as an act of war or retaliation for what they regarded as acts of war with some justification. And the traditional distinctions we make then between war, crime, espionage, all those things, it looks like these are really getting fuzzy, eroding, uh, running into trouble. And that if we, if we look at the, the crime side at the top there, crime and vandalism, those tend to be done by private individuals for personal gain or gangs or something. War, that's a collective state act to alter state policy, and espionage is kind of a low-intensity version. Hacktivism is right in the middle there, and it now seems to be available and being used by states as well as individuals for political purposes. In the same way Clausewitz said war was used for political purposes. We're trying to get people, we're trying to punish them for, for harming us, we're trying to humiliate them, or we're trying to bend them to our will. Sounds like war to me, except it's not. It's clearly not. And this whole phenomenon viewed in this way, this has begun to be something that we're paying attention to. A colleague in, um, at the University of Warwick convened a large convention not too long ago, <clears throat> to talk about, um, about the rise of hacktivism generally and <clears throat> how, we, how we should think about that, and at the same time tried to uh, examine the way in which states are increasingly using this as a method of settling the quarrels that they have in lieu of presumably armed conflict. State-sponsored hacktivism is a kind of a unique thing. It doesn't fit into any of those little spheres, not precisely. Um, so where does it fit, and what should we do about it? And this is what, to go back to the title of my talk, I, colleagues and I have begun to call soft war, in the analogy with soft power. And if that's a right way to think about this, it suggests a new kind of, of method of conflict that sort of blends elements of vandalism, hacktivism, crime, espionage, and uses it as a state-sponsored instrument of war. But it isn't war. It isn't equivalent to a use of force. It's much less destructive. It's much more nuisance-oriented. <clears throat> and it is not covered under the international law of armed conflict. You have here one of the most brilliant international legal scholars in the world, Michael Schmidt, who has done an incredible amount of work with colleagues all over the world trying to understand how current international law would or would not apply to, <clears throat> to, um, to cyber conflict. But that's if it does something like Stuxnet did or something like I portrayed in the first conflict scenario. This. I mean, this is going to be a lot of work to try and get international law that doesn't say anything about espionage to cover this kind of thing. Um, so how are we to make of it? And when we think of that as a technique of, com of combat used by states or groups to adjudicate the conflicts that they have with their adversaries, it's not limited to cyber. You know, so far, we've only talked about cyber. But there are other techniques available, economic techniques, techniques that use international law. Um, there are media operations. There's, there's disinformation and propaganda. You put all of that in the tool chest. And a lot of these aren't new. It's just grouping them in this way and using them for this purpose seems like it might constitute a whole new era of conflict that we're calling the era of soft war. Um, and it's in that context, and with this I think it's time to wrap up, it's in that context I think we should look at the revelations of, uh, of Snowden. Uh, because, of course, there was none of this discussion when he revealed what he thought he knew about how NSA was violating American privacy uh, by collecting, doing all this metadata collection. 
And I think I sent you all a read ahead that I did on this uh, some time ago on the uh, NSA Management Directive uh, 424, this enterprise knowledge system, treasure map and all that stuff. I don't know if any of you had a chance to look at it, but it, that <laughs> I had some pretty good technical advice from the deputy director of, and of the CIA at the time writing this. So the, the technical stuff is, is better than it would have been if it had been on my own. Um, but the point that I tried to make there and that I'd make now here with regard to this is this is miscast as an invasion of privacy or any, any even anti-terrorism. This may be one of the things we need to examine if there is this new phenomenon of soft war. How are we entitled to fight it? What are we entitled to do? What in particular are we entitled to do in the way of self-defense? And even more particularly, is it possible given the nature of soft war that some things would be permitted that wouldn't be permitted in hard or kinetic war, such as deliberate targeting of civilians and civilian infrastructure. Um, these, these questions uh, need to be examined. Another thing that might be permitted is what we're already engaged in, and most of you know that what NSA was really doing uh, was, uh, was preemptive self-defense. They were trying to defend against acts of terrorism and crime and, and even warfare before they were committed, not trying to track them down and retaliate after the fact. Well, preemptive war is not usually permitted under the, um, certainly in the laws of armed conflict or in, in the use ad bellum, uh, ad bellum regulations that Henrik was talking about before lunch. Preemptive war is basically a no-no. We tried one of those once uh, this last decade and didn't go very well. And you know, so um, in the kinetic sphere, we don't license preemptive war, but it seems like in the soft war case, we might be able to make a case for it. It would still be the case that the wars fought with these means would only be fought for a good reason and that they would be, we would demand that they inflict damage and that was kind of the argument we were having here in the, in the room about how much damage has been suffered and how much are we willing to do in retaliation. That's the principle of proportionality. But these two hard war principles that are very, very firmly entrenched, that you tend to go only after military targets and not deliberately target civilians, it seems hard to imagine how soft war would work without being allowed to loosen those boundaries. Ought we to tolerate that? Uh, certainly, these should be, if not a last resort, a next to last resort. Uh, we should try normal means of conflict resolution first, and soft war should be fought only after all those have been exhausted, but perhaps before you resort to kinetic conflict, which is what I think is the transformative feature here. Um, if we think about a new era of soft war involving but not limited to cyber, as incorporating some of the insights we learn from conventional war about when it's to be fought and how it's to be fought, and others recognize that they were there for a reason, but those reasons may not exist in the soft war case, then it's possible we have begun to come into an era in which conflicts, very serious and grave ones, can be adjudicated, fought, one side forced to do the will of the other in the Clausewitzian sense, without necessarily doing irreparable harm and damage to lives and property and treasure. That's the promise of this. The problems are enormous, and on those, I invite your questions and comments. Now, thank you very much. Did I leave you any time? George, it occurred to me as you're talking, this um, seems to be about where the discussion of air power was between World War I and World War II. Um, you know, you had the theorists like Douay and in a slightly different way, Mitchell, who thought that this would be a way to, uh, to avoid uh, frontline warfare, mm. that you would simply uh, do, do either do or threaten enough damage to the adversary's economic system and morale that you would avoid having to actually fight the war. Right. It's, the difference is this might How's actually that work. Out for us? This yeah. might actually work <laughs> yeah. as opposed to, yeah. uh, as it turned out, that theory of air power didn't work out very well. Um, so uh, if it would actually work, as long as we're good at it, wouldn't this be good news? 
I think it possibly could be good news, yes, yes. Master these techniques, and I think also, as with previous eras of war, you come to some kind of consensus of practice with your adversaries about better and worse ways of fighting it. Uh, that's very important, and we don't know what those are now. We're busy experimenting, and so far we haven't hurt anybody terribly badly. Uh, knocked out a few uh, um, um, nuclear centrifuges, I think, is the only damage we've done of any great physical amount so far. Uh, but a lot of tacking and counterattacking is going on, at least in the cyber domain, and I don't think it's clear to the people carrying it out exactly what the limits are, what the ends and goals and purposes are, and how well the practices are serving them getting to those ends. Okay. Just one item of fact for the audience. Uh, he, uh, George mentioned Michael Schmidt, our colleague here at the War College in the International Law Department. Uh, he produced a really excellent manual with a bunch of colleagues called the Tallinn Manual for, from Tallinn, Estonia, which was the attempt to uh, figure out what international law about all this would be. Uh, at this point, it's just a bunch of people offering an opinion about what it ought to be. So they've run it up the flagpole and we'll see whether anybody salutes or not. Right. But, uh, so it has no, no legal status except that it's the opinion of, considered opinion of a bunch of international law Very well-respected experts, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions for the audience? Please. You say that this is uh, new, uh, but for the soft power, <coughs> nation states have been using economic sanctions for years. <coughs> yeah. Uh, this is no different. Right. Uh, by using that, and it's a very low bar of entry with, for, for cyber, so it's much cheaper. Mm -hmm. do it that way. So it's not necessarily new. Uh, the Talon Manual, of course, uh, brings open the discussion, the global debate, but uh, we don't have a common language for us. We don't have a common agreement on what's right, what's wrong, uh, internationally speaking. So that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. The other problem is that uh, the governments don't own cyber domain. Commercial enterprise right. owns the cyber domain and the infrastructure. So uh, when you're talking about dollars and cents and profit, uh, companies don't really want to listen to their governments because that affects the bottom <laughs> line. So yes. the other thing is you can't see this. This is, you know, people tend to, you know, virtual, virtual presence is actual absence, so they can't see it, unlike the, mm -hmm. the example you gave with the ninjas, so they can't believe it. but. Right. Hysteria works, and we saw that it was in four cases of Ebola in the United States, but mm -hmm. people were going crazy about that. Right. So it's just a matter of educating the people and comparing cyber to, isn't it more akin to like uh, global warming in a, in, a, in a way? Because <laughs> the cyber domain is a man-made domain. It's arguable that the uh, global warming is a man-made problem, but no one can agree on what to do to stop it. A lot of really good questions and comments there. Let me parse some of them and try to, to respond quickly. Uh, the point about the Tallinn Manual, that it doesn't have any you know, authority or anything, yeah, the, the, one of the great disappointments about this is uh, that uh, by and large there's no prospect of any new international, you know, constructive international law on the topic of cyber conflict in particular. Nobody, you know, surprise, surprise, uh, the world community is very much like the American community. Enough laws. We don't want any more laws. First, let's kill all the lawyers and so forth. Uh, so the Talon Manual got a resounding, uh, you know, vote of approval at the United Nations level from countries who weren't included in the process and so forth. So yeah, we don't know how to think about it and uh, we're not making a lot of progress there. Um, the issue of whether software itself is new or not, it's not that economic sanctions haven't been practiced and disinformation and propaganda and psychops. It's linking them all up with some other things that nobody ever had or would thought of at the time, such as lawfare, the use of human shields by um, Hamas. Uh, if they're volunteers, then the Israelis technically under the law of armed conflict can't shoot at them, right? Uh, and so you've defended a target with people. You're not supposed to do that, but you're using the laws of war against, um, you know, as, as themselves a kind of weapon. Um, cyber, it's linking them all up. And the founding document, maybe some of you know this or have read this, is a, a, a monograph that you can find online. Um, and it's called Unrestricted Warfare, written by two PLA colonels in 1998-99. And they essentially laid this whole strategy out. 
I said, we, they didn't call it soft war, uh, but they said, you know, sort of, this is, we're gonna have to fight wars in new ways because the Americans are so strong, their conventional power so great, their wimpy reliance on technology so overblown that they'll just blow the rest of us out of the water. So we've gotta find new and creative, clever, jiu like uh, ways of fighting, and, and they listed all of these things, including cyber. And so in a way, the founding document is that one, and then this is just giving a name to that doctrine. Okay. Uh, what else? Uh, conventional uh, uh, commercial ownership of, of the cyber domain in particular, who, and the, uh, the commercial entities, uh, Verizon and Comcast, they don't want to have to do anything you know, they're already mad that we found out that they were helping provide metadata to NSA. They're not gonna do anything more in the future. True, which means that A, it's hard not to target civilian targets if the civilians own the infrastructure, if you're carrying out cyber conflict. And uh, so that rule against doing so, which I thought made sense for a while, but now I think it sort of doesn't, uh, or at least we need to work on it. I, I, I don't know what to do about that. Uh, but it makes the civilian targets available uh, because everything passes through them in the case of cyber. Um, I can't remember if I, there's many more things you raised that I'm not sure that I've addressed accurately. I'm sorry. There was one back there. Yeah, yeah please, go ahead. Hi, sir. Uh, Senate Commander Mike Klein again. Uh, I wanted to uh, make some comments on the uh, the aircraft analogy, going back to uh, pre-World War I, and uh, mm -hmm. there's kind of three things I, I think that are different with that and with cyber today. And uh, the first one is kind of like an asymmetric problem. The United States is much more reliant on cyber than uh, many of our possible adversaries are. I mean, for example, North Korea, you could cyber attack them back to the Stone Age, and it would still be a day that ends in Y. Uh, they wouldn't really notice the difference too yeah. much, whereas your we, average citizen would not suffer. Yes, <laughs> they're already busy suffering. So yeah, we Got would it. definitely notice that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and likewise, you could see the bombers going to the cities. You could see the bombers coming back. It was much easier to attribute attacks to whichever nation had launched the attacks. Mm -hmm. Whereas nowadays, you can you can route uh, packets through proxies. You can make attacks appear to be coming from the United States itself which is kind of a lawfare problem because we actually need warrants to do that investigation now. You can't mm -hmm. just do it as a military intelligence right. problem. Right, right. Uh, I, I kind of forgot what the third one was, but. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of stuff here and it's all a mess, but I think your point that, you know, well, how much mileage, I'd put it this way, how much mileage can we get out of the analogy with aviation? Some, not much. I mean, it's, it's heartening only because it's a large area of public concern about which we knew nothing a century ago, and now we've pretty much worked it out. I think that was Jim's point. And he said, we'll, we'll do it here too, we just need time. But then my rejoinder was, okay, here we are, let's do it. And you see the doing of it is, is, is hard work. If you see what Mike and his colleagues did in the Talmud manual, it's, it makes the Talmud look like a simple document by comparison. I mean, they really had to do a lot of gymnastics to make existing legislation that was already fairly clear apply to all these cases. And some would, well, and it doesn't, you know, that's just you guys. Um, and uh, so what we have to do in the larger arena to get this worked through, I think we're still years, if not decades away. Uh, and what it will look like when we're done, I have no idea but I think we need to get on with it. Yes, okay. Sir, Tonic Manor, it's Sonus, uh, United States Navy. Uh, in terms of analogies, uh, one thing that kind of struck me was maybe this is more akin to Age of Exploration, British East India versus Dutch East India Company, um, where you had this confluence of uh, governments wanting to obtain new colonies, but at the same time leaving it up to these mercantile uh, interests to actually pave the way through it. These mercantile interests sometimes getting into their own kind of armed conflicts with local tribes, but also with their European competitors. Um, you know, at a certain point in the, in the history timeline, the, the British East India Company get, essentially gets nationalized. Um, and a lot of these companies, same thing with, with Dutch uh, East India Company as well, and with regards to what they did in, in Indonesia. But maybe that's kind of where it's gonna go. It's gonna default That's back really, to yes, that, that, that's another good place historically to look for some insights. Uh, how did we deal with the private, public, military, state-sponsored versus uh, 
you know, commercial sets of interests on the high seas at the beginning of this Westphalian period that Martin and his colleagues have been talking about. Um, how did that work? Uh, can we learn some lessons there? Uh, I, when, when we think about military contracting and its issue, I mean, there, there were military contractors all the time in those days. Miles Standish, to quote one, you know, cite one famous local figure, was certainly a, a hired, paid military contractor, uh, as were uh, uh, John Smith in, in Virginia, as the East India Company paid um, British naval officers to crew and uh, command private um, gunships to protect their um, trade cargoes and so forth. I mean, this public-private thing, there are a lot, of, a lot of lessons we could learn from that period that I think would, would help us. What specifically they are, until we get out to the hard work of rereading those documents and those histories and taking those um, <coughs> courses and so forth and, and putting that to work, that's still, we still need to do that. But I think it is a rich resource. Yes. Yes, sir. Tim Commander Tim Tran, uh, U.S. Navy. I kind of want to revisit, um, <clears throat> I think, how we phrased this going into, the uh, into this situation of the cyber. It seems like we've chosen uh, the word, go through the, the uh, choice of words of hacktivism. Uh, yes. And as you mentioned, kind of choice from uh, political activism. And I'm, it's surprising that we chose to follow the path of a civilian. Uh, type of way of civilian uh, activism, civilian way, so that we say that we can't do anything because it's, we can't aggress, we can't be in a, actively do anything in the warfare wor uh, world because it's, um, it's more towards civilians, we can't take this or that action. I'm surprised that we didn't take a path of, that they are cyber aggressors. And when you mm. take the path of cyber aggressors, uh, and I know it's a parsing of words, people can say that, but I think when the world started with suicide bombers, right? I think for a while there, back in the world, we, we decided, why did we choose suicide bombers? And then we tried to go and rephrase that to say, you know what, they're homicide uh, bombers. Mm -hmm. We tried to kind of change the dialogue, but it went too long. And by, I think if we choose the word cyber aggressors, uh, instead of doing the path of hacktivists, then it allows us to go, and go down the path of either uh, law enforcement or military kinetic action. Um, I think those are the things just my opinion from seeing this, where you go with the soft power, uh, we're mm -hmm. choosing the passive approach instead of an active approach to say that as we walk down this path, as we define this, and as you said, the rules of the road starts to be defined. How do we do this? I think we have to retake really a look at how we define uh, the words so that we can be able to attack it. Because you see this problem, and I think this becomes part, if hacktivism becomes a part of what we see with the irregular warfare. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, down I, in, you know, the, the guys down in Guantanamo, right? We've got to make a right. decision at one point. Are they criminals, terrorists? What are they at? Yes, exactly. But once we made a decision um, by saying that they're cyber aggressors instead of hacktivists, we give them a path that we can actually take a action at. What do you think on that? Sir? Well, thank you very much for those very, very astute comments. I think that the, the sum total of them suggests um, words matter. Concepts matter. They either clarify or they obfuscate and confuse. And if I heard you right, you're worried that using hacktivism with its political connotations and it's, it, it's maybe not the right word to use in this case. If so, what is? Your larger comments made me think of another very esteemed colleague who we've lost to retirement here at the War College, uh, William uh, Professor Rubel, uh, nickname call sign Barney, <laughs> Barney Rubel, uh, who brilliantly outlined this kind of a process that we go through in, in terms of IEDs and suicide bombers and so forth. He said, look, you know, there was once upon a time an age of heroic warfare with big ships and guns and conventional armies and so forth, and, um, uh, and, and, and you know, really great commanders. And then we got into this sort of systemic, uh, uh, sorry, systematic uh, technological warfare where it really didn't matter if your commanders were all that good or not. You just had such great stuff and such great people together operating it that nobody, this is the thing the Chinese theorists were complaining about, we, we can't stand up the Americans anymore. They have mastered this new form of systematic warfare. We, we can't touch them, nobody can stand up to them. But that doesn't make conflict go away. So what happens? People learn new modes of conflict. And I think he called the third phase systemic where they would uh, invent little 
things like, you know, you, the robots come and you paint the, the lens of the camera so they can't see. Uh, you put an IED out there and blow up your, your uh, troop trains. You uh, um, use suicide bombers and so forth because those are the weapons available to you to pursue conflict. And, uh, and now, you know, what happens next? Well, of course, we come back with predators and cyber stuff and whatever, and do to them what they did to us, and everybody's always off balance. But I thought it was a very interesting evolutionary notion of how warfare goes, and maybe we should get Barney to come back and talk about this, because I think it's very useful, and it helps us with the question, how do we conceptualize what's going on and understand what initially is shocking and deeply frustrating to us when these cyber aggressors or these suicide bombers or whatever do what they do, our initial reaction is like yours to the first scenario, anger, fear, outrage. But we need to think clearly about what this is and how we kind of respond to it and combat it. And okay. that still needs to be done. Okay, I, I know there are other hands out there, but I want to give you adequate time in your seminars this afternoon. So we'll, we'll quit for now. Thank you very much, George. And Thank please you. make your way to your seminar rooms. And I'll see you back in the morning.